Hi, welcome once again to Drinking from a Distance with CNE Advanced Technologies. I'm Jeremy Foltz from the CNE Marketing Department, and I'd like to welcome you to our third installment in the series covering CNE's AMR lineup, our autonomous mobile robot offerings from Mir. Your host today will be Dana Poling, and he'll be going through a brief presentation of the Mir AMRs, as well as giving you a demo of the mobile robots that we keep in the office. And as always, we'll be featuring a local craft brewery. Uh, today's beer comes from BrewDog, which is actually headquartered in Scotland, but they have a U.S. headquarters not too far away from c &E in Columbus, Ohio. And the beer I'm having today from BrewDog is called East Coast Crush. It's a light New England style IPA, uh, very refreshing for this time of year. It only clocks in at about 4.8%. So you can knock a couple back on a beautiful spring day like today. I'm here in my backyard and this has been very enjoyable for, for me. Uh, you can probably still find some on shelves, uh, although it is a limited release, uh, but I would definitely recommend this one. It's, uh, it's really got a great aroma uh, and a, a great flavor for this time of year. Now our goal is to bring you something that is both informative yet fun. However, CNE does not endorse drinking at work of any kind, nor do we endorse the beverages that we're featuring here today. Uh, we're simply just sharing some of our favorites. And with that, I'd like to say cheers. And I'll throw to Dana. Thank you, Jeremy. Five here. I think we're ready to go. Excited to be at the office today. This is week three for our drinking from a distance series, and uh, we'll be talking about one of our favorite topics today: our mobile robots from Mir and Auto Guide. And we're also pretty excited to be talking about BrewDog, a place that we kind of love and kind of where our Cobot Happy Hours have started. Um, so, just kind of a reminder at the end of this: if, if any folks that are out there weren't on the first two weeks, we will do a quiz at the end. That'll be 10 questions, 10 seconds apiece, and we'll have prizes for the top three places. Uh, today we'll have some CNE pint glasses and a couple other cool things to talk about once the quiz gets there. But we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, we're probably going to push up against an hour, I'm guessing. We got a lot, of, a lot of stuff to get get through. So let's jump into the uh, over or overview for the mirror products. Bring that thing up here for you to see. Should be coming up now, hopefully on your screens. Buddy there to see. All right, should be seeing the mirror logo there. So also for folks that uh, maybe didn't catch it the first two weeks, I apologize that this is repetitive for the ones that have been on both times, but just a little bit about us before we jump into mirror. So been around since 78 so this is our 42nd year in business and you can kind of see the uh, image up in the upper right there that covers the geography that we cover we cover that with about 37 or so outside sales folks um, we're about 115 people total and the second bullet that you see there is one of the things that really sets us apart from some of the other companies out there we have 19 engineers i'm happy to be one of those 19 folks and our job is really to help develop bills and materials and kind of work alongside you to get uh, solutions deployed we don't, we don't take ownership necessarily of the projects, but we like working alongside you and kind of teaching you how to fish and making sure that we, uh, we talk about quite a bit. The picture you see on the bottom left is our new home. So it's being built uh, just a few miles away over in Miamisburg. This shot was, I think, from last week or so. So they're getting making some progress on the roof, and we're hoping to be in there this summer. Looking forward to that. Uh, this is a little bit just about the product lines that we carry and product groups. Um, so Turk and Banner is what we were built on back in 78 and still a big part of who we are. So sensors and vision and safety, really what that was all about in our early days. 2000, we came on board with Siemens, the full line automation and motion and controls house. Um, and then the newer stuff that we're kind of highlighting here in our drinking from a distance series are robotics, pneumatics, and marking systems. This is our second of the uh, series focused on robotics products. And the stuff that we're going to focus on today here on our robotics line card Really looking at the right side and all the mobile stuff. We are an auto guide and even Rowex who makes top modules for the um, We also talk a little bit about kind of rebranding. So the, the 
folks that are out there that have known us for a long time know that we were C&E sales forever, and we're now C&E advanced technologies. Went that way on uh, our 30th anniversary. Oops. Um, just kind of better reflect what we do. And you see our new core values there. So we talk about doing the right thing and we've got your back. And that's especially important when we talk about these mobile robot technologies. This is a really young technology that's being developed. I must have my auto plug. Take it over here for a sec. Um, so this is a young technology here with, um, with the mobile robotics and just something that I always make a point when we talk about these to kind of tell you that we're not here to sell you a robot and run. We want to make sure we get you the right robot and uh, see it through. Uh, maybe a robot's not the right thing for your application, too, and we're, we'll tell you that if that's what we want. So why are we talking about mobile robots? I guess that's kind of our question. And it's all about internal logistics, right? Most of our customers are making some kind of stuff, and they have to get that through the production floor, material coming in the door, and then back out, out the door. Traditionally, that stuff has been handled by fork trucks or by uh, AGVs that follow tape in the ground or by conveyor systems that aren't flexible at all. Stuff to change. Uh, it's also the, re the really big driver recently has been people, right? So folks pushing carts. Those guys have been really hard to find. Find somebody that wants to get out of bed every day and come push carts around on the cart. That's really what's driving the market here. I also talked in our first week about how new technologies really advances society and advances folks. There's a lot of discussion out there about robotics taking jobs, and I think we need to change that conversation. I don't think they're taking jobs. I think they're just eliminating the jobs that people don't really want to do and giving them an opportunity to step up to something that's a lot more purposeful. That's kind of what this graphic shows, taken from an A3 conference earlier. We also talked about these jobs that were kind of uh, made obsolete by new technology showing up, so the lamp lighter, the ice delivery, yeah, I was running the switchboard down there. I'm also a personal example of that. I worked straight out of college in a uh, plant that made TV picture tubes and glass for those. There's not much of that stuff being sold. That's kind of how I got to C&E, &E, and I certainly consider myself better off for that. All right, so the one term that we want to kind of drive home here is AMR instead of AGV. So AMR stands for Autonomous Mobile Robot. Jeremy kind of alluded to that in the introduction. This automation, this animation kind of shows you what that's all about. So the AMR is intelligent enough to figure out that something's in its path and it navigates around it, where the traditional AGV, the things that kind of follow tracks in the floor, if you block its path, it's got to wait for that to be removed for it to navigate around that. So that's a big differentiator between the AMRs of today versus the older AGV. Today. These are the five robots that Mir makes. Fifth one was just introduced last month at the Modex show down in Atlanta. Um, and the way they do their model number schemes, the numbers that you see there represent the payload and kilograms that you can put directly on the robot. So the Mir 100, for example, is the smallest payload unit. It's 100 kilograms you can put directly on it. And then the Mir 1000 is the biggest one. It's 1,000 kilograms directly on that. And there's a couple of different things we can do with the robots to kind of modify that. Um, and we'll talk about that as we kind of get more into the product presentation. Here's a timeline of just the, the company of Mir. So you can, like I said, this is a young technology. These guys haven't been around very long, and really nobody in this space has. Um, so the founder kind of made his first model out of Legos back in 2011, established the company in 13, and uh, partnered up with the current CEO in 2014. And their first robot was just launched in 2015, so only five years ago. And basically every year since then, they're releasing maybe one robot or one significant technology module to add to their lineup. Um, the most recent of those, like I said, is the Mir 250, and it's kind of the star of the show on the smaller robots. Um, and the Mir 1000 was launched uh, last year. Two things we've highlighted in the bottom of the timeline in red there are two things important to us. So in 2016, they came here, established their operations in the U.S. and New York. That's also when we began working with them in the street. 2018, another really big thing on their timeline happened. They were bought by a company called Teradyne. We're going to hear more about them as AutoGuide has also been recently by Teradyne. That's kind of what spurred on the ship that we have with those. Guys. So there's a lot of people in both this cobot market and the mobile robot market, um, just smaller companies, and there's probably a lot of those guys that just aren't going to make it. So it's really nice knowing that they've got a company the size of Teradyne behind them to, uh, to know, give you a little peace of mind that these guys are going to be around for a long time. 
a little bit more about Mir here so you kind of see some of their locations. They're based in Odense, Denmark. Uh, it's, there's several other robotics companies there. Actually, there's, several, there's over 100 robotics companies there that have all spun out of kind of one university. Um, but Mir themselves are about 220 people around the world, and they're still hiring, ramping up for sure here in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Kind of see their growth. They've hired maybe 100 of those over the last year. And the small blue dots that you see are the distributors they have all over the country. So if you're a multinational user out there, there's a good chance that there's a distributor or a mirror office that's fairly close to you. Here's a little bit on the sales, kind of where they've come from. You can kind of see this how this ramp up is happening here. So last year, uh, they finished the year at about $44 million in sales and uh, certainly look to make that big jump again this year. And so far, we've had a lot of users that have just had one or two of these things in R&D, kind of lab, prototype sort of environments. This year is really where we're starting to see people deploy fleets of these now, 5, 10, 20 of these things at a time, managing the fleet. So that's just really starting to take off, and it's going to lead to some much bigger numbers here. See the bottom, I just kind of included this product adoption curve. This is a general technology adoption, just to kind of put in perspective where I think we are with this technology. I think, you know, where we're at in this curve is still early on. I mean, we're in the early adopters of the visionary stage. People refer to it kind of as a baseball game being maybe in the second or third inning now. It's going to be pretty exciting to see over the years what's happening here with mobile robots. Uh, just kind of a question that comes up quite a bit, you know, how many of these things are out there in the world actually working? So far, we've got about 3,500 robots out in the world. And, you know, for the past several years, North America has represented about 30% of that market. Here's some of the big customers they're working with. We've got a few of them here in our tri-state area that we've been fortunate enough to work with. You know, you see places like Toyota, Schneider, and P&G, and Whirlpool that are all kind of our territory here. Companies that are all working with. So let's talk a little bit now about how the thing works. Uh, the laser scanners are a big part of what's going on here. You know, we talk about... Uh, natural features and there's no infrastructure changes required and that's true for both Mir and AutoGuide as we look through this. A lot of the things that I show you here as part of this Mir presentation really apply to AutoGuide as well. Laser scanner or LiDAR SLAM is, is that. SLAM stands for simultaneously localization and mapping. It's done with two laser scanners on uh, Mir robots. So you can kind of see the graphic on the right the laser scanner up on the upper right and then on the lower left. So it has 360 degree coverage of the area around it. Kind of shows you the different warning zones. And we'll see some different graphics that show those different warning zones. Laser scanners look out quite a, quite a ways when they map the area um, get started. This little animation here kind of shows you this. What you see on the right side of this screen is near software. So once we go through this presentation, we're going to jump into the, so the software live, so I'll show you a lot more what's going on there. But that's what you're seeing. He's driving this robot around with the joystick and creating the map. So this just kind of shows him doing that. This is, you get the robot out of the box, this is usually about the first thing you do. And again, we're going to do this live here in a few minutes to see what that really looks like. But you see, as he's driving it around, the laser scanners are relating information back to the encoders on the wheels on the robot, and it's just uh, using the software there to build out his map. These things that are on that map that are both static and dynamic. And once you create the map, one of the things you do, uh, first things you do is take off a lot of those dynamic things. If map carts or fork trucks or something that aren't always going to be there, go ahead and clean that up. And that's kind of what we're talking about here on the right side of this slide. Um, that shows a cleaner map over there. Uh, but if you do map some things that are dynamic, not the end of the world. The robot really only needs about 35% of that mapped information to localize itself and know where it is. And then left again is another example of the different zones, the safety zones that are on these robots. So they're showing some different zone sets there. So the robots will switch those zone sets based on the speed that it's driving. The faster it drives, the better out it has to look to make sure that it can stop in time to be safe. So let's go a little deeper on some of the products here. I don't know if we need to hit on all of them or not, but the one we've got today uh, that we'll show you live is the Mir 200. So the 100 and 200 are both the same footprint. They're just geared a little differently uh, for the different payloads. And the 500 and the 1000 are also the same footprint, same thing, just geared a little differently. Those are the heavy movers. And the new guy in the middle here is the Mir 250. So it's kind of a unique size. All are yet than the 100 and 200. 
let's go look at the 200 here just to kind of get an idea of what it can do. So we talked about the 200 number being the payload of the robot being put directly on it, so 440 pounds. Uh, you see a towing capacity spec there that we'll talk about with the mere hook. So if you put a hook on top of this thing, it can uh, pull a cart up to 1,100 pounds. Uh, precision is another question that comes up. You know, if you just drive this thing from spot to spot out in the open with no other markers, it's good about plus or minus two inches. And if you add what we refer to as a BL marker, which is really just a small bent piece of metal that has a 120 degree angle in it with a flat beside it. The robot can use the laser scanners to detect that VL shape. And it's good to plus or minus 10 millimeters, I think is pretty conservative. I've seen it do, you know, plus or minus a quarter inch pretty easy. Uh, the speed is one really important characteristic, especially when you're looking at applications that might require multiple robots. So as we kind of go through simulations or do robot estimates, how fast that thing travels has a big impact on the number of robots you'll need. The 200 is actually the slowest robot we've got at 1.1 meters a second. Thousands also in that kind of that slower range. And we look at 100 and the 250 and the 500, those guys can go up around 2 meters a second. Um, so that can make a big impact on your turn. Uh, battery runtime is another question that's asked all the time. So most all of these have a battery that's designed to run for about a shift. So 8 to 10 hours, kind of dependent on how you're loading it and how much it's running. That's the, the initial design. 100 and 200 actually have space for a second battery in there that can double that battery life. And the other ones, uh, the 250, 500, and 1000, have a 48 volt system that just charge a lot faster. So you can swap those out. You've got opportunities to charge while you're running. You may just be able to do charging there and keep powered up with that faster charge ratio. Um, that guy, so let's go back now. That's the 200. Here's the 250. This is the new one and one that's, uh, I think, going to be pretty popular going forward. See, it has that 250 kilogram or 550 payload. It has the new uh, laser scanners on it. So these laser scanners are made by SICK. And kind of one of the philosophies of MIR is that they're using just off-the-shelf components. So if you take the top off of one of these guys and kind of look at what's inside, it's all standard stuff from uh, the SICK uh, laser scanners. There's SICK safety PLCs. Power supplies and contactors they use are all things you can find from your local electrical distributor. Really, you're buying their software package and their design. You see here on this one, the new 250 is a SICK, SICK NanoScan 3 scanner, and you see the precision now is plus or minus 5 millimeters with that VL marker. That new laser scanner allows us to have a little better positioning accuracy. Again, it's 2 meters a second, so that's going to be a big deal, and it has that that charge of 0 to 80% in one hour. So that's kind of an 8 to 1 charging ratio. That's really important um, when you have high uh, requirements. Shift operation, you don't have time to let the robot sit. The faster that thing charges, the better, obviously. And if we go look at the 500, it's another one that's capable of 2 meters a second. So these are kind of our pallet movers. Um, they're usually driving into a pallet rack and picking up skids of components. Uh, but still that 48 volt system and fast charges. Here we spec it as 10 to 90 percent of the battery in an hour. Still kind of that 8 to 1 uh, charge ratio. These have SICK MicroScan 3 scanners on them. You can see here, this is a good time to just look. You see the cameras kind of on the front of the robot in the center. Those are two different 3D cameras that kind of look out and up uh, for things that above the laser scanners and below in the laser scanners. Uh, a couple other things that show that. Um, so that's kind of a look at the robots there. Mir themselves don't make very many attachments. They kind of leave that up to third parties. So there's a you know a pod on their website we'll talk about a little later that's dedicated to certified third-party top modules. Uh, but they do make a lift shown down here. Um, and they also make the shelf carrier. So the shelf carrier is made for the 250. That's a top module that you see that's made for driving under um, shelves. And then it can just pin to that, and the casters actually stay on the floor and helps bear some of that weight. We're still showing a payload on this slide of about 550 pounds. So we didn't increase the payload any there. I think probably we can. I'm not sure if there's an official spec on it. This guy's still just being released. It's actually, they're not shipping yet until next month. We'll see an official spec on what that is when we use it in this mode. But I expect that's going to be probably more like eight or 900 pounds. I know the concern really is um, moving that kind of weight. You have to make sure that you're capable of stopping it. It's not a matter of whether or not you can or not stop it safely. 
then here's the lift for the 500 and 1000. So these are mounted on top of the robot. You can kind of see the black bumper that runs around the picture on the bottom there, the 500. Lift is the piece that's sitting on top of that, and it's shown in its extended position. So it strokes up 60 millimeters to pick something off of a pallet rack that looks something like this. So you can envision that one on top driving into the pallet rack and then extend it up 60 millimeters, lifts that thing up, and then drives back out, and drops the back flush to take it off to its neck. Those are going to be pretty common applications. I've talked a little bit about two things, the VL marker and doing some charging. So here are the automatic chargers that are available. One on top is the one that's used for the 100 200. It's got two spring-loaded pins. As you see the V shape now in the front of the charger. So that's the 120 degree angle I was talking about, uh, flat on the side of there. So the robot can dock to that charger uh, accurately enough to hit those charging pins. The little ones have spring loaded pins on them, and then the, the charger to the bottom right is used for the 250, 500, 1000. Charging plates are actually up under the robot, so it drives over top of that and turns the charging relay on. So this can be done as an opportunity charge, and when you send it to charge, you can tell it that I want to charge for a certain amount of time or until the battery re reaches a certain charge level or until it receives a mission to do something else. So Mere Fleet is a software package uh, that's used for managing multiple robots. So if you've got several robots that need to share the same space, this is the software that's used to manage that. Uh, it also manages the batteries of those robots, so it can monitor which ones need to go to a charging station. It can monitor when an operator calls the robot to do a job or if the automation system calls the robot to do a job. The fleet is the one that can determine which robot is closest or best suited to do that job. This is a separate standalone software package. It's a one-time software that resides on a server. You don't need to do multiple robots. If it's just a single robot or maybe even two robots sharing a space, there's no actual software charge. With Mir, the software all resides on the robot, except for this one. The AI camera is something that's also sort of in development right now, and it works in conjunction with the fleet. Really two different use cases that's been uh, discussed so far. First is the one that you see up top where it says selectively blocking a fleet zone. The idea was that we need ways to monitor really busy intersections to communicate to the robots that hey, uh, there's something in here right now. It might be a fork truck, it might be a person, it could be somebody, uh, a tugger coming through there, somebody pushing a cart, but it learns what those things are and then communicates to the robots that you need to stay clear of here until those things are all out of the way. And then the second one I think is going to be maybe even more useful. It could monitor a, here it's shown a cart, but it could monitor a skid or just wherever the pickup location is. Once that package is ready to be picked up, you know, if the skid is fully completed, it can then recognize that that is the case and call the robot to come pick it up without having to have any other kind of interface from the operator. Or And the last component I also mentioned a little earlier, this is the hook. So it's available for the 100 or the 200. And it's a top module you see that goes on top of there. The hook is really unique. There's not, I've not seen any other uh, mobile robot companies with something like this. Um, and it's kind of nice in that it allows you to use existing without very much modification. So modification you do have to make, you can kind of see in the bottom right QR code. You may have to add a little grab bar for the hook to grab onto, like a one-inch square tube. Definitely have to add the QR code, and you can see there's a, there's a camera on the hook that does the searching for the QR code, and that's how the, the robot knows dimensions of the cart, and it also knows exactly where it's located so it can dock to it and pick it up. So it sees, it knows how big that QR code is, and it sees the angle that it recognizes it at, and then it can dock properly to that, pick it up, and drive away. Uh, so there's a couple things that you don't really appreciate just by looking at these pictures. This is a fantastic idea, but in practice, there's some things to be, to be a little wary of. It needs a little bit more room to operate, um, and it also needs some fairly wide aisles so that it can navigate can't reverse with a hook with a cart attached to it also. So when we looked at that 250 in the shelf carrier, that's a pretty maneuverable solution. But you have to make some modifications, whereas this one, there's not many modifications, and it's probably not quite as maneuverable as that 250 shelf carrier. All right. That's the hook. So, so this is Mere Go. I also referenced this. So this is their portion of the website that shows all of the third parties third-party modules that Mir has certified. 
there's different categories there. Uh, one of the companies, the only company that we carry at CME, that's a third party for the beer, Proac. And you see a couple examples of what they make down on the bottom left. So they make a top roller for the 500 and the 1,000. This is kind of made to made up to existing roller conveyors just to transfer the part onto the robot and take it over to a stretch wrapper, for example, is a pretty common application. Uh, they also make some different lifter systems. So those, you, we see a lifter down there, that's their L150 that's made for the Mir 200. So Mir makes some lifts for their bigger robots, but they don't make one for the smaller ones. So that's Proact comes into play. And that's a, just a section on their website. Uh, this little application video here, we'll go ahead and cue it up and share the audio so you can hear it talking here. Uh, but this just gives you an idea, shows you a lot of the different kinds of top modules here. And this really gets you thinking. You can spend a ton of time on YouTube looking at all the various applications. Mir's got a really robust YouTube page that shows a lot of this uh, different use cases here. But this would be a nice example. The use of mobile robots enables us to implement these optimizations in order to improve our efficiency, productivity, and safety. Our Mir robot automates the transport of raw materials to one of our latest assembly lines. So we came across the mobile robots from Mobile Industrial Robots. They immediately convinced us with their great flexibility. Since then, NIDEC KPM has deployed three MIR-100 robots. They autonomously transport material and empty containers between warehouse and assembly. We use MIR as a conveyor belt. We use it to transport our semi-finished products and our finished goods, but from production cell to production cell and from line to line. There are no people involved in producing the high volume products. This means we are very dependent on the MIR being able to deliver items to a robot which in its turn can deliver items to the mirror. We chose the solution from Mir as we saw three significant benefits. First of all, because of its high flexibility, that means that the robots can be used in various production processes. Another benefit is the programming, which is easy and intuitive. This means that we don't need a specially trained expert to use it. It can be managed by a regular employee. The third benefit is that it is very user friendly and easy to use for our employees in the production where Mir is summoned by a simple click and it performs the program tasks. So it's really important for us to be able to have the robots automatically open the doors, uh, which was done by a Bluetooth interface. We also needed to get the robots to be able to use a lift, so fleet controller and having the robots be able to automatically control the lift was a really big thing for us. It gives me an easier workday, and when talking safety, it is much more safe having the Mir 500 drive instead of having me drive a pallet truck. This is especially regarding collision and other things that might happen because we drive so far. Mir 500 takes its surroundings into account. It detects and avoids the humans walking around. And of course, the pallet trucks. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little idea of the way these things are used. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so we talked about, we're going to look at the software here in a bit. This is a little more on the sensors that are there. You know, these are the sick MicroScan 3s that are on the 500s and 1000s. So those, again, work in a plane that's eight inches off the ground. Uh, but then you also have the 3D cameras. So they look kind of down and up, up to like, depending on the robot, 1.7, 1.8 meters high and out uh, in front of the robot some. There's also some proximity sensors on the 500 and the 1000 that are, that are being brought in for detecting um, some small low profile objects that are closer to the robot. This is kind of that same information for the 100 and 200, uh, similar sort of thing. You got two different 3D cameras in the front. And then these guys also have some ultrasonic sensors in them, helping with the blind spots and uh, for pallet detection and, and also for uh, like clear objects. So if you got some glass walls or something like that, help with those. Uh, this slide is in here just kind of as a reference for safety functions on the robot. So if you, you look at the bigger ones, you're basically at PLD category three with everything. And that's just because we're at kind of at the mercy of the uh, laser scanners. That's as good as you get with laser scanners. Um, and that's true for the 200, 500, 1000, 250. 
Uh, the 100 didn't get all the safety upgrades there. You're kind of dealing with a little lighter payload, so it doesn't have necessarily all the safety functions that the other robots have in it. We talked about this a little bit earlier also, but this is just a different look at it. So kind of showing you the different speed that the robot's driving at and how far out in front of the robot those safety fields are. Again, the faster it drives, the further out it looks, forward and reverse. That's what it looks like on the Mir 200, and here's what it looks like on the Mir 500. This guy now, we're, you know, we could be carrying 1,000 pounds, so as this thing gets up over a meter a second, it's looking out 135 centimeters ahead of it, so it's looking out, you know, whatever that is, four feet or so for us here in the U.S. Uh, it's got to make sure stopping time is the critical thing here for it to be. Um, so ownership, we, you know, I talked earlier about C&E. We, we want to transfer ownership to you. We, this is not something that we want to integrate and, and own. Uh, we certainly want to be able to, to have a product champion at your facility that is familiar with these things. And uh, the software is such you'll see here pretty soon that it's, you know, it's pretty intuitive and certainly something you can get your hands around. But Mir has made it really e easy uh, with Mir Academy. So this is a free online training that's really well done. They've actually just in the last couple of weeks put several different videos up that are super helpful that are like five to eight minutes long for some of the common things that trip people up. Um, you see that there's also no cost here with altering setup. So this is something, again, the software resides on the robot. There's no cost with this thing having to be tied to the cloud. Kind of yours to control. And, and back on the training side, we also do free training. Mir does the free training right now in San Diego and New York. Of course, that's kind of on hold at the moment, but it will resume in. And then we can do, you know, today, I can do something similar to this where we get on in the software remotely or, you know, once we're allowed to, again, we'll be back at your place and, and we can do it on site with, with uh, several associates there. So this is the big slide, right? This is kind of what everybody wants to know. How much of these things cost? What's my return on investment going to look like? And that's kind of what I'm just trying to put into perspective for you here. So I like throwing some ballpark numbers out just to let you know where you, you know, give you an idea of where you're at. Um, and then put it in perspective. So these robots cost roughly the same as what one person does for a shift for a year. So you see my funky little uh, new currency there that we developed, this SPY, the shift person year. And because there's no ongoing cost, again, this is a pretty unique thing for both Mir and AutoGuide. There's no mandatory cost that you have to, to keep up with, with software updates or access to the robot or cloud access. Um, with these two, that's that's not the case, and with most of the competitors, that's that's not true. There are always uh, are some ongoing costs. So I just kind of look at a three-year example there of the two-shift operation for one person. And, you know, if you, you have that case with a person kind of running this, that's going to cost you six SPYs uh, with the Mir robot because it's a one-time cost up front and really very low ongoing maintenance cost. You may have to replace a battery at some point or a couple of casters, but there's not a lot to fail on these guys. Um, you know, you see that the six-to-one kind of cost ratio over three years in that two shift operation. Really fast ROI on these. Now the price point on the Mir robots are a little less than what they are on AutoGuide, um, but you may have, it may be a different application there also, but both are really quick ROIs generally, especially if it's at least two shifts. Uh, and just kind of mention that leasing is available here. Um, you know, lots of times we may be replacing fork trucks and we recognize those things are often uh, leased vehicles, so we want to just be able to make that transition as easy as possible. If that operating money is easier to get for than capital money, we have a way to make that happen, and that's true with both Mir and AutoGuide. All right, so now we're going to uh, kind of flip to a split screen in just a second. I'm going to show you the live software, and then we're going to show you our the uh, the room we have here at our office, and then we're going to talk more about AutoGuide, kind of a product overview there. Um, a lot of the stuff we've talked about with Mir really applies there. And then we can uh, also look at a quick simulation, the software we're using. But before we do that, let me stop sharing and let's talk about a second beer from BrewDog. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. There we go. All right. So the second beer that we have, so Jeremy did a nice job introducing BrewDog, and actually um, our first Cobot happy hour that we did was at the BrewDog facility down in Canal Winchester, which is just on the south side of Columbus, pretty close to where I grew up. So they built that, at least they started construction in 2015 down there, and they actually have a hotel attached to that place, a really nice restaurant. And the place that we did this first Cobot happy hour in was 
Museum. Uh, so it worked out great. They had a couple big screens there. It was a really nice facility. Uh, but the second beer that I've got here is this Hazy Jane. So this is, is somewhat similar to the one, the IPA that Jeremy had, kind of that New England Hazy IPA thing. And again, for as our days turn a little sunnier here and more spring-like, um, they're pretty tasty, pretty tasty beverages. I kind of like the Hazy IPA. If you were on week one, uh, we talked about the Who Cooks for You from Jackie O's. Uh, it's got a similar taste to that. A little, little hoppier maybe than this last IPA that we'll talk about, maybe a little more so than the one that, that Jeremy had. But um, I think with that, let's kick it over to our split screen view, and we will show you the software, and then we'll show you the office setup that we have over here. Audio there. Wait, wait for those things to pop up for you so you can see what we've got going on. We kind of have our office set up in our uh, dance party mode right now. We've got the ballroom set up over here so you see a big cleared out area. Um, if we can get to the split screen there. Just seeing the map now, so we need to get the split screen. Okay, all right. So you guys should be able to see everything there. So we got some space cleared out in our conference room here. And what I've got running right now is just a little, a simple uh, loop mission. We've got three positions that are that are in the software. This looks a little like what you saw earlier, uh, the video, the guy making the map. So I just kind of ran this thing around and made a quick map here. Uh, so the black stuff are the walls. And then we've got some tables and chairs that are here. Uh, we've got some red areas that are forbidden zones. So just kind of keep the robot from getting in trouble. What you see, some of the, you see some red flickering dots in there. So that's live laser scanner data. You kind of see me down on the bottom right. You see those red lines kind of swinging around. That's actually my leg kicking out from under this desk. And I've got a mission here, this 200 demo loop with try catch. If I go ahead and fire that thing up. And this is that software interface we looked at earlier. This is just kind of a built-in HMI that's in the MIR software. So you've seen the MIR just kind of took off from that first point. You see the blue dots showing the route that it planned to get to the second point. It gets in the orientation. It plays a little R2-D2 that I told it to play. This, this uh, mission that it's running right now just will run back and forth between these two positions. It'll get over here, and you can kind of see it. It probably will show us a little different color. Give you a little bit of Arnold there and head back out. It's just going to keep running back and forth while I do that. If I actually walk out and get in its way, this is back to that AMR technology where it can kind of see me and navigate around me. You may not hear much audio as I walk over here. Ten different times before it kind of gives up and errors out. You can you can set that. We'll take a look at that in the software. I want to pause that guy, and then what we'd like to do is just kind of show you how that whole thing looks from scratch. But this is our end product here. We've got a map with a few positions running a decent loop. Dashboard. We'll come back and talk about the dashboard a little bit. Go ahead and take that mission out of the queue, and let's just see what that looks like from. So to do that, we got to create a new map. So we go over here to setup and maps. And again, I'm just connected to, I'm actually on our internal network in the office and the robot's connected to that also. I go down here and look at my, I think you can see the available Wi-Fi networks. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Is that up or is that? It doesn't matter. So it, it broadcasts its uh, its own network ID. It has its own Wi-Fi address, and it broadcasts that as the serial number of the robot, basically. It depends on the model number and the serial number, but you can just connect directly to the robot and do any of this stuff. And so you can see right now I've got this active conference room map. That's what we're on, but we're going to create a new one for right now. We're just going to call this C&E conference room. And I can have multiple sites uh, for different facilities. We're just going to put it on our C&E advanced tech site. They create map. Kind of to get things started, we just go over here to these three dots and say record and overwrite. So we're going to start from scratch. Mapping. 
it's going to pop up and show me what those laser scanners are seeing. So that's what, as it sits right there, kind of over there by the doors, it's just seeing, you can see that, you know, because it's static right now, there's a lot of blind spots behind some of these tables and chairs that are over there. Here's that joystick that you saw in the video with the guy driving around. I can go up and grab that thing. I put it in manual control. And now I've just got control of it here. And you can do this from the PC like I'm doing. Or you can do it from your phone or an iPad or whatever it is. You see as I drive it around, it builds that map up just like you saw in that video earlier. Or you drive it around, you know, it'll start filling in some of those blind spots. Need to be too worried about all those. So it maps anything it maps as white, the stuff that it considers a floor and place that it can drive, the stuff that shows up as black or walls that it has to stay away from. And then the gray stuff, like you can kind of see behind a, a chair over here, a podium, that, that was an area that it didn't see. So it just left that as gray as unmapped territory. So we'll say that's got our room map. I'm going to go ahead and hit stop on it. And it's going to give me a chance to rotate it. And the rotation really does a couple things. It makes it easier for me, kind of where I'm sitting to uh, understand where we're at. I kind of put in an orientation that makes sense for me. The other thing is you kind of want to get it at these straight uh, horizontal vertical lines so that the, when the robot plans its routes, it doesn't have to make uh, intermittent jogs to kind of back. So that looks pretty good the way we're sitting here. And then the first thing we're going to have to do, once you get done mapping, the robot doesn't typically, kind of depends on the model and the software version, but it doesn't typically know where it is. So there's a button up here on the right that says set the robot start position. Pick that, and i got to tell it where it's starting at. So it's somewhere over here kind of between the doors, and it's looking off in this direction. And this doesn't have to be exact. You just got to get it kind of close. It says, yeah, I kind of feel like I'm somewhere close to here. This button adjusts it, and it starts snapping those things in. So now that red live laser scanner data lines up exactly with the walls that I had mapped, and the robot knows exactly where it is. I can go ahead and refresh the browser to get rid of some of those clouds. The purple clouds that you see are the obstacle avoidance clouds. So it puts a cloud around anything that the laser scanner detects and anything that the 3D camera detects, and it knows that it needs to kind of stay away from that. So the robot knows where it is now on the map. Uh, then the next thing that we do right away is put some forbidden zones anywhere we don't want the robot to go. So the robot can't see downstairs. We learned that kind of the hard way in one of our early demos back in 2016, and it took a trip down three or four steps, not this robot, but a different one. We now always go in right away and put in some forbidden zones. Kind of just draw it in. And this is kind of a Microsoft Paint sort of thing. You just kind of draw lines or shapes wherever you don't want the robot to go. I'm going to say, all right, keep it out of those spots. Save that over to it. Again, this is all residing directly on the robot. We could, if we wanted to right now, we could go into our walls place. And if we had some of those dynamic obstacles that we didn't think was going to be on the map all the time, we could go in here and choose this eraser tool. And again, this is kind of like Microsoft Paint. I could just say, you know what, this was a fork truck that was driving by, or these were people that were standing over here. They're not really going to be there. So I just go in and take those things off the map. And if there is something there, of course, it's still going to see it. You know, it's going to detect that with the laser scanners and the 3D cameras. Now we've got a pretty good map to work with. Um, Next thing we probably want to do is give it a couple positions, at least a couple positions, just mission running. Here's one position over here, kind of in the middle of the room. We'll just call it middle. Say OK. And then here's another position somewhere up here closer to me. This one, me. Now we got two positions and a map we can work with. The next thing we need to do then is to, to create a, a mission, get it to run back and forth over here to my missions tab and it, this will show me all the missions that are currently in the robot and we also have some, some template missions now so here has included some things that are common tasks to go up in the template missions we're going to create a new mission with the spots that we the positions that we just made i'm going to call this one cd for drinking from a distance and what we're going to do is just a couple of move statements so you see now across the top here are all the different kind of commands that are available put a couple of move statements in here and we're just going to tell it to move to those two positions that we made. So here's CNE conference. So I'm going to tell it to move to me. And this is those 10 retries. And then how close do I have to be to be satisfied that I hit that spot? Validate and close. Then we're going to send it over to middle. Same thing, validate and close. So this is a pretty simple, just go to me, go to the middle, not in a loop or anything, but just a one-time sort of thing. 
Um, so if we go into our missions again now, it'll show those. That guy. Go into our missions over here. All missions. And we'll find that CEDD. Over on the right side, you see the mission queue. And there's nothing in there right now. Click the green button here, and that puts the mission in the queue. And you notice maybe that this thing up here kind of shook at me and said, hey, I'm not in play mode right now, so I'm not going to do anything. So I'm going to pick the arrow to put it in play mode, and it's going to take off. And it's going to tell me what it's going on this screen, but I like these dashboards we have built in, this built-in HMI, where I can kind of go watch the map and see what it's doing. Here's that live look. So it just went to me. That was the first command that it had, and the second command that it had was to go to middle. So it's going to figure out a way to get back to that one. And that's kind of the end of that mission. It's just going to go over there and stop, and that's all I told it to do. So if we wanted to make that thing loop, complete this mission here, and the, the orientation that I told it to be. Say, and now I'm waiting for new missions. I don't have anything in my queue again. So if I wanted to in that mission, I could go in and loop that thing and get it to continue doing that. Go back in, edit that mission. And under my logic up here, I have the ability to do a loop. So you kind of see some other stuff here, these breaks and ifs and some other logic capabilities. That stuff all goes up here, kind of standard things you would guess. Here now I can drag my move command inside of that loop and it'll just keep going back and forth. The other thing I can do here is play a sound. So any kind of wave or MP3, you can go in here, pick whatever you want. You know, we got some of the, the common or the fun stuff there, the night riders and the good morning Vietnam. Got turn it up to 100 inside here, it'll be pretty loud. Cut it down to like three seconds. And we can show a different color light if you want to do something there. Seconds. Move to the middle. We can play a different sound. We'll give it a fog horn or something. Here. Down a little bit. bit for a few seconds. So now we got a little different mission and we're going to run it in a loop so it just keeps going back and forth. Back to our set of missions over here. And we put that guy back in our queue. Go over and look on our dashboard at what it's doing. And it's just going to show us that same thing. And it's going to keep very similar to what we were doing uh, when I first showed you what was happening here. The other thing you see on the dashboard here, we've got some mission buttons over here. Oh, there he is. So you see down on the right, I have module one. So one of the nice things about here is that they've got some built-in wireless I.O. And I've actually got a box right here. I don't know if you can see on the little screen here, but I've got this box with the, with the Advantech wireless module in here. It's got four inputs and four outputs. Go ahead and pause that guy for right now. He's going to keep running back and forth. Pause. But I've got uh, this I.O. that shows up. Go over here to set up an I.O. module. I'm connected to that thing wirelessly. So this, this I.O. module is connected straight to the robot. We've got a little green light here that you may be able to see. And if I turn on output one of the software, you can see it's mapped to that. Same kind of thing. I've got a button on this side. Back off. I've got a button on this side that's mapped to input zero. So that's. Um, so I can, if I want to, go back into my mission and use that slot. Go back to our CEDD. Back here and edit that thing. And instead of going to the middle just on command, I'm going to go over and look at that I.O. module and say, wait for input. The rainbow light. I'm going to go look at that input it's on module one and it's mapped to input zero. And I'm going to wait forever for that thing to come on. Validate and close. Save that guy. Back over. Back over to our missions. Take that other loop out of there because I didn't have a way to stop it at this point. So I'm just going to re queue this one. This one now has wait for the input. So this guy. Finish that. Look at it in the dashboard again. There it is, getting to me. Again. Now it sees should in the bottom right. It says waiting for that input zero. So it's not going anywhere yet until I hit this input. And this is just one simple way for an operator to interface with the robot. Easy way to make a call button station. Build into the software, you don't have to do any program to make it really nice and free. All right, so let's pop.
pause that. Um, if we go back, I just want to show you a couple things here. We're already at 350, so I don't want to take a ton of time. Uh, but let's go back into our map. I just want to show you a few of the zones that you can put in there. You saw the forbidden zones, and there's a, several other kinds of zones that are pretty helpful here as you look at them. Conditions we work on, so markers, the big marker, uh, our shelf, we pick up shelves like that 250 shelf carrier, and charging stations. So if you put those things on the map, you, those show up as a marker, and then you can dock to the charging stations. Task, uh, directional zones are you have one-way traffic, especially if there's a lot of fork truck traffic where you're trying to implement your AMRs. Uh, one of the best practices is kind of have them all go in the same direction so they don't have to face off in the aisle. Uh, and then we talked to forbidden zones, but Bird zones are kind of the opposite, so those show up as a green path on the map, and when the robot's planning its route, you see those blue dots, that's its route plan, it's trying to figure out the cost of that route. The bin zone has infinitely high cost, so it'll never plan a route through that. Preferred zones have really low cost, so it wants to go to whatever cost. Unpreferred zones are kind of in the middle, it's kind of, you know, we'd rather you not go there, so it's a, still a higher cost, not as high as the forbidden zone, but you can go there if you absolutely have to. And critical zones allow you to plan paths through obstacles. So things that may show up as an obstacle that aren't really, that allows you to get through that, like a tight doorway or up a ramp maybe where critical zones let you navigate through that. Speed zones are fairly obvious. You can draw zones on the map to kind of increase and decrease the robot speed. Sound and light zones, similar thing. You know, if you've got a busy intersection, you can draw a sound and light zones so it will automatically beep a horn and flash a light when it's going around that corner. Similarly, through the I.O. module zone, you can turn on, just like this I.O. module I just showed you, you can turn on an I.O. module that has an external strobe or an external light or an external Planner zones let you do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, things in there you can do, like no localization. If you're driving down a really long hallway where there's not a lot of uh, geometry for the robot to localize off of, you can just turn off the localization strictly on the encoder information. The other thing you can do that's pretty neat that comes up a fair amount is you can put it in line follower mode. Sometimes folks don't like the robot to deviate from its planned path on its own. They want, want to kind of set a path and stick to that path with a traditional AGV without having to put the lines on the floor. Planner zones give you some ways to do that. The last two are fleet-specific kind of zones. So limit robots is just, hey, I don't want 20 different robots in this small little area all at once. Evacuation zones are, you know, can I find a safe space to send the robot if there's a fire or something? That's kind of the stuff you can do on the map. It's pretty thing. One other thing I just want to show you that's a newer feature in the software is you can go in and change the robot's footprint. So if you look in there, look on the map, there's a shadow that shows up around the robot. And that's what determines how the thing navigates, how those purple clouds show up, and it, it makes it uh, such that it avoids obstacles. We've got a new tool in here now. If you were to drive under and pick up a wider shelf, for example, as this kind of dimensions, you could just change the robot's uh, footprint based on that. So there's the dimensions for the robot, and then it will navigate based on those dimensions so that shelf wouldn't get into a wall or any other um, So we're already at 355, so let's just jump out of that guy there. Um, and I want to talk uh, about auto guide for a little bit before we get into some simulation. Jump over here to the auto guide present. And like I said, a lot of the stuff you've seen here about Mir really apply to Auto Guide.
back over here to our station. Put these back up on the shoulder. That got the uh, cord. We should pull it over here. Gotta reshoot. lag here in our screen share. There it is. All right. Hopefully you can still hear me, uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about AutoGuide here before we get into our quiz. Um, so AutoGuide, like I mentioned earlier, they're also owned by a company called Teradyne that owns Mir, um, and they are a really nice complement to Mir. Um, what they have are automated fork trucks and tuggers, and they are built in Georgetown, Kentucky, so it's really nice having those guys here kind of in our territory. Um, they are, uh, they're Started by a company called Heartland Automation, who's also been a good customer of CDs for a number of have that relationship here. We also have R&D and engineering up in uh, near Boston. We do some training in both of those sites. Talk a little bit more about the products themselves. Um, it's really uh, it's a modular platform, so it's the Max N10 or Max N15 now possibly as well. But if you see kind of the uh, assortment of products down at the bottom, robot itself is that piece there with the black structure top with the laser scanner on it. That's actually the uh, the mapping LIDAR that you saw similar to Mir. Uh, and then you just add different attachments to it. Okay, you have the ballot stacker attachment that you see there, where you have the tugger attachment. We're also showing a high bay uh, fork situation that's kind of in prototype now and hopefully be on the release. A six foot high bay stacker. A couple other more custom things they've done for some of their customers. Top of the slide here, he talks a little bit more about um, Auto Guide and kind of their um, where this thing has come from. So again, really new technology. They just kind of decided to build their own thing in 2017. One thing that really, obviously, that gives them a ton of control that they're not just slapping on attachments to somebody else's fork trucks. It also really uh, makes for nice lead times. Their typical lead times run six to eight weeks, which is about half of a lot of the folks. They also have a four mile an hour, so 1.8 meters a second speed, so it's not quite as fast as what the Mir 250 and the Mir 500 are, but we're also usually the heavy loads. And this is natural feature stuff, so no modifications to internal infrastructure. Also, with off-the-shelf components, open up the side of one of these units, it kind of looks like a, your, your typical cabinet. So we talked a little about the capacities here. There's two different versions of the pallet stacker. You've got a 1,770-pound version and a 50-pound version. And they've got smart pallet finder technology, sensors there that will allow it to find the pallet and pick the forks. Uh, the Max Tugger is now released up to 15,000 pounds, so that is the weight capacity of the Tugger. Uh, I don't know if there's a limitation on the number of parts of the Tug, but we can do a train here. So we saw the beer hook earlier, one of its limitations is that really it's only designed to do a single part for the Tugger, the Max N15 Tugger can do a train common requirement. They also have a fleet software package, similar to what Mir does. Monitor that. There's another look at the adapters. Just uh, this little video here, see if the audio comes through.
So there may not be any audio coming through on this right now. What this is showing is their fleet software here. And I just know a little bit about how the difference what here does. There's solid in the volume here. Here comes the auto comes in. Again, we're moving heavier. That's that control panel as we're going through. Here we're just talking about the modular design. You got the manual drive option, which is a really nice option for these guys. Somebody can come on and flip a switch and just take control of that thing manually. So just a couple of static shots again on the, the SurePath software, just showing you a little bit about what, how that thing looks versus what uh, what you see from here. You know, we kind of hope as a distributor here that one day these guys kind of come together on a software package. I don't know, you know, if that'll happen or not, but uh, we're hopeful that, that maybe some someday down the road we'll be able to control all these from the same package. Uh, what you see here, these black dots, um, the auto guide refers to, this is kind of how they do their mission. So they don't have a separate logic editor necessarily, but each of the spots along the path, there's a command that the robot will execute as it gets there. Uh, this being so new to us, I don't have a deep dive on this software yet. We were actually supposed to have training last month. and Our current situation, that had to be postponed. So looking forward to getting into that a little more in depth and being able to share the software with you much better than what I can today. But that's uh, certainly on the short horizon here. And again, I just, you know, some ballpark pricing. This is a little different, uh, a little different realm for pricing versus the mirror. Do you see fully integrated solutions here? This is not just a strict hardware cost, but these uh, typically we're going to have Heartland or other authorized integrators that we're partnered with provide fully turnkey solutions. So this gives you an idea, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars to get one of these up and running. And there's some benefits to doing multiple robots here. So, you know, as you spread the cost of that fleet software out over robots, you do that. They also will sell the robots without the batteries. So if you have a fleet of port trucks already that use batteries that are, that work with the uh, auto guide design, you could just continue using those batteries and charging stations, so that's a cost you might have. Similar to what we did with Mir, you should kind of see some of their big customers here. They're right across the street from Toyota in Georgetown, Kentucky, and obviously Toyota's been a huge customer for theirs. They had a really big win um, probably a year or so ago. They went through a really long uh, evaluation with Toyota, kind of against their own Toyota material handling system, and Toyota selected these guys as their uh, automated port trucks and tuggers of choice their global spec. You get an idea, you know, AutoGuide has been a fairly small company, uh, relatively speaking, until this Teradyne purchase. So they've really focused on these big customers. And now as they're going through distribution and we're, we're getting sorted through there, um, I expect these guys make a big splash in the marketplace this year. Be a part of. All right, so that's our presentation. So if I get any cooperation at all from my PC here, I'm going to throw over to our, eh, yeah, I think we're going to skip the simulation in the interest of time. We're already well over an hour here, so let's just go straight to the quiz. I will tell you that I'll just throw this thing up on the screen so you can kind of see it maybe. Um, popped up over here, Whitney. If not, there's a package called FlexSim that's a free software package uh, that helps with really estimate the number of robots that you're going to need for your job. So you can kind of go in and lay out your plant facility, correct dimensions, all your throughput information, you know, how many parts or packages, how many pickups and drop-offs do we need to make per hour, robot speed, and then the amount of time that the robot needs to dock. And you can get a pretty good indication, a nice visual indication of what your robot deployment will look like. We also have some spreadsheet tools to help with that. Get into that too much in depth today since pushing our time here. Um, I may also be pushing my PC's limit. <laughs> it's struggling a little bit. All right, so let's see if we can get the quiz up over here so we can uh, get the prizes going. Uh, okay. So if everything's working, it looks like it's popped up now. You should be able to go to joinmyquiz.com, and you enter this game code of 
1136. And we'll start seeing you guys jump in. When you go in, please put your first and last names in there so that we can identify the winners. Hey, and speaking of winners, I don't know if Eric Ellison is on here today, but he has won both the first two weeks. So he's gone for the three-peat if he is on here today. Uh, so we got to have somebody knock him off. He's getting too much of our goodies. Speaking of goodies, what we're going to do today, we're going to send c &E pint glasses out again. I've also got this Sphero Mini, which is a robotic, or I'm sorry, an app-controlled robotic ball. Maybe I'll see it on the screen here. Uh, but it, it might be fun to play with at work, but certainly if you got some small ones, they'll have a good time with it. I've had uh, two or three of my kids have a good time running around, but it's a pretty cool little device. Looks like we got some folks starting to pop into the quiz here. Hey, I will also say regarding some of the folks that may be out there, we had a uh, an interesting sign-up for the virtual series this week. Mr. Ted Nugent has signed up with, <laughs> with us. So, Ted, I hope you're out there and you've really enjoyed the uh, presentation today. Oh, so... I did have uh, I did have a third beer um, from Brew Dog. So this one is Elvis Juice. So Hazy Jane and Elvis Juice are two of the more popular ones. Elvis Juice has got a little bit more of a grapefruit taste to it. It's another kind of similar to that New England IPA, one that you can drink a couple of and, and uh, be feeling pretty good about things. Nice spring day again. I'm not going to crack that one and open it here, but. Uh, uh, you know, we appreciate BrewDog and, and really all our local craft breweries. You know, Jeremy Foltz, who is on with us, you saw Jeremy at the beginning. He's here today with us. Um, you know, he's, he's done some work to kind of help prop up the American brewers. And those folks need our help like a lot of other small businesses right now. So we're kind of, you know, part of this deal is just helping support those guys. So some of the prizes we're going to have here will be swag from BrewDog today. Um, so we'll do a third place, $25 limit, $50 limit, and $75 limit first place just like we did the last couple of weeks uh, so we'll send you whatever you'd like from brew dog if that's a t-shirt or a mug glass uh, they actually do their own home beer kit so this elvis juice that i have right here um, you can buy if you're a home brewer you can buy a kit to make your own um, so that would be an option for you uh, but we'll contact uh, the winners here and give you an option to, to tell us what you'd like from brew dog but we want to support those guys and please go out and support the local folks also some of the bigger ones here, BrewDog's actually a really big one. They've got somewhere over like 80 locations around the world. Um, so we've got three or four of them here in our territory. I guess there's three of them in Columbus now, um, between Canal and downtown. And then we have one in Indianapolis, and then we've got one in Cincinnati also. There's one over in Pittsburgh. So I guess that's five really just in our territory that C&E covers. Uh, but, you know, there's a ton of them, whatever city you're in. Uh, go out and support those guys. A lot of them are doing delivery now. Go online and buy some stuff. I'm trying to help those guys out a little bit. Uh, so we got a few people in our quiz here. We'll give it another minute or two to get some folks in. Um, help things go. I will just offer again, uh, you know, with the current state of affairs, things kind of being shut down just about everywhere, it seems, until May 1st right now. I'm available if you've got other folks at your facility that want to see the software. I have a robot that I can run either from here at the office or even from my home office. So it's not that big a deal for me to jump in and show you the software and do something really similar to what we did. Or if you want to see a simulation, like I said, that FlexSim software is really useful in visualizing how your deployment might look. We can kind of lay that thing out and get a high level look at how many robots would it really take to maintain whatever the job is there. We can help with ROI calculations and that sort of stuff. You know, with Auto Guide, that's a little more difficult. They've got vehicles that weigh too much for me to get in the back of my minivan. I can do that pretty easily with the beer stuff. Maybe one day we'll get to that, but not today. We do have a uh, big Ford Transit van, so for you guys that aren't familiar, we've got ways to transfer the uh, mirror demos that we have. So we have currently a 100, a 200, and a, a 500. We're hoping to get a 250 here when those become available in the next month or so. We're happy to bring those things to your facility. You know, we can map these things out. You saw how quick it was to map that thing and get a mission up and running. So we can do a pretty full demo on site for a couple of hours. Happy to do that. All right. So I think we got some folks in the quiz. I'm going to go ahead and start it up. You think we're ready to go? Yep. All right. We'll go ahead and hit start here. So there's 10 questions, uh, 10 seconds apiece, and we'll see a leaderboard pop up here. And uh, good luck. Here it goes.
Alright, let's fucking come in. Like Sam's got it locked up. Second. Oh, 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 All right, I think that's it. All right, we'll be in touch with the winners. Um, I don't know if you guys got to see the podium there or not, but it uh, looked like um, Sam and uh, Sean Frost and Jason Marsh. Um, we'll be in touch with you guys either probably probably in the morning. I'll shoot you an email and uh, see if we can't get something lined up from BrewDog. Hey, we appreciate you guys hanging with us. We went a little long today. Sorry about that. Uh, always some technical issues with these things. That's all right. Uh, hopefully we got most of the uh, points across here, but uh, look to look to uh, see you guys in person really soon. Take care and uh, enjoy the spring weather. See ya.